attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. It will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world, the way it was, and the way it is in your memories. All right, welcome everybody to episode 16 of the Retro Disney World Podcast. This is entitled Walt Hired Me, a chat with Tom Nabby. I'm your host, Todd McCartney, and with me as always this month is JT Couser. How you doing, hey, JT? Tom. Good, how you doing? Pretty good this month. Uh, Brian P. Miles. Greetings and salutations from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. All right, and as always, how Bowers from down Aloha. Aloha. We're getting Aloha this month. So, all right, so this month we have a, uh, a special guest, uh, as the title suggests, is Tom Nabby. We're going to be talking to him shortly. Uh, but before that, we always rewind to last month and, and talk a little bit about any corrections and comments and how you you you, um, you had something from last month that you failed to mention, and uh, it was a condiment. We had a condiment issue here, didn't we? Yes, yes. When I was going over uh, the members of the uh, the kitchen crack pots, I failed to mention Mr. Mayonnaise on the drums, and I, I felt terrible about it ever since we did the last month. So let me rectify that. So this is a bit of ketchup. Yeah, so <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So you're fired. Oh. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so so Mr. Mayonnaise was part of the group along with the uh, the salsa, the barbecue sauce, the Parmesan cheese, and uh, am I forgetting anybody else? I think that's Sarah. I'll now forget someone else. We'll go together. Some, they all look like craft products. As we, right. The interesting thing about you overlooking Mr. Mayonnaise is it was probably the most identifiable mm -hmm. condiment with the sponsor. I mean, it right. looked like a craft mayonnaise. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it looked exactly was, like a craft mayonnaise bottle. And he is literally dead center on stage yeah. in front of the broccoli. So you <laughs> couldn't miss him. <laughs> He's the Jermaine Jackson of the group. <laughs> Okay, so uh, how thanks for that tidbit there on on mayonnaise, bringing that back in, and uh, I think uh, let's see, we had two other individuals write in with some uh, clarification, want some clarification on some parts. Um, the first one was Justin Hilden, and he wanted to know if Bonnie Appetit was modeled after anyone. How do you know if? I don't. That is a great question because she, as we talked about on that podcast, there's everybody has a very, uh, very sort of period specific look. But I, mm. I don't know if she was modeled after anybody in particular or that was just the artist's drawing style and they went with it. So uh, I, I guess if we can track that guy down someday at a Disney event, we will uh, wrestle him to the ground and ask him. That's right. <laughs> Find out the answer right to the bottom of it. All right, and we also had Rick Webster um, again on the topic of Kitchen Cabaret uh, going back to last month. Uh, he said when talking about Bonnie Appetit, you mentioned there was a tour you could take or still see her, an operator. And uh, he wanted to know what was the name of that tour because he's going down there with his daughter on her first trip. And uh, there's so many tours he wants to do, and it sounds like this is one that's uh, on, his, on his list. Yeah, and it's a really cool tour. So uh, as long as you can do the five or six hours, it's it's totally worth it. So for for adults and uh, older kids, it's it's a really great tour. Um, it is now called Backstage Magic, um, and we uh, I tweeted to some CMs that used to give the tour. Um, she is usually still on the tour, but depending on what's going on in Central Shops. Uh, there are, have been occasions when she's been pulled to the side, like maybe if they needed a, a larger space to work on something. But chances are, if you go on the tour, uh, you will probably see her. Um, it, it is a really cool tour. It's it's uh, similar to the one that JT went on, where you get to go to the backside mm -hmm. of the American Adventure. Right, right, and, yeah. Uh, and watch the war wagon move back and forth. So you got that from her podcast. Um, you get to go into the Attila doors <laughs> under the Magic Kingdom, which is usually a big deal. Uh, if you find Walt's frozen head, let us know. <laughs> Could still be out uh, there. Yeah. Uh, you get to go to Disney Hollywood Studios uh, into the uh, Twilight Zone Tower of Terror and then see some of the costuming uh, stuff going on. Uh, you get to go to Animal Kingdom now and uh, hear the guides talk about uh, 
<laughs> what it's like to, to work that job. Uh, and Central Shops, you get lunch at Whispering Canyon Cafe in the Wilderness Lodge. And then you get to hang out in the tree farm, which might be exciting to somebody, <laughs> but it seems kind of like the low light to me. If you can, let's say I can look at trees or I can work a robot. That's right. I think I'll take the robot. A little more mechanical things for me. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to do the tours one of these days. So, well, thanks to Rick and, and uh, Justin for writing in. And um, with that, with people writing in, let's uh, transition right over to uh, listener mail. So, JT, we've got some listener mail uh, that came in this month as well. Um, you ran out to the mailbox, getting cold out there, but you, you still managed to find your way to the overloaded box. Um, what do we What do we get this month? First one uh, I got was from uh, a guy named Dan Curry. Dan uh, says, this has been driving him nuts for years. And he said, uh, with his mom and dad's memory, you know, not what it was. He wasn't sure if this is, you know, something he'll know for, you know, fact, like, or it's just a, a story in the family lore. But he recalls a tram ride um, at the end of the day when he went through different areas like Dinosaur Land and the Paris sewers. Um, and he's guessing summer of 81-ish. And... That I'm going to default to you guys or our listeners because that was before I was born. Um, <laughs> you know, so I don't really know. I can't help Dan on that. But the Paris sewers and the dinosaur land. Anything? I, well, I mean, 81 predates Epcot, which why I would say dinosaur, you know, universe of energy. Mm -hmm. The Paris sewers, I, I don't recall anything with Jean Valjean uh, in, the, in the sewers. <laughs> maybe, maybe his parents took him for a, a stroller ride through Epcot under construction from uh, yeah, University of Energy been, Dinosaurs that's... and then back to World Showcase, uh, Paris, while they were laying the sewage pipes. Yeah. So the... I don't know how, how, I think this is probably not. Fun. Yeah, this is, this is, I tried to dig in and see, uh, you know, there were a number of other, uh, early theme parks in Florida, uh, Florida land. And, uh, there was some stuff around silver Springs and six gun territory and pirate world. So and you couldn't find any evidence of lay sewer. <laughs> I no no sewers and no dinosaurs. Uh, of course, huh. Disneyland has the, the famous dinosaurs from the mm -hmm. world's fair on their train, but that doesn't really make any sense with the pair of sewers. Um, you can take apparently a very interesting tour of the the sewers in Paris, if you're actually in Paris. Right. Of course. So, uh, We're having trouble with the dinosaurs linking them to Paris. Yeah, right. That's the oddball <laughs> thing there. But uh, maybe they time traveled to the Paleozoic era. Oh. And yeah. then that, yeah, that jumped back been. into the sewers. Back so, to the future. Well, this the isn't Disney related. If anybody has any interest in, or, or any information in helping Dan carry out, uh, it would be great if you remember any other, uh, any other ride. We normally don't derail here but uh from disney but if anybody has anything it was yeah, a really interesting email listen. and dan if you find out we want to know yeah i'd love to, to know because i want to find a film of it and ride yeah. that attraction yeah. <laughs> um gotta be, last... gotta be something somewhere <laughs> something yeah we uh we got a tweet too from mike mike mcginnis and he sent us some pictures of some matchbooks from pleasure island mgm in the grand floridian uh resort so love a good matchbook did you guys yeah, get a game with that those thing. The uh, Grand Florida one is the old box style where you could oh, of course it box is. through. Uh, and then the <laughs> other two were the, were the flip. Yeah, well, you think about it. You know, the studios and, and the Pleasure Island were, the, you know, were just a simple matchbook. But the Grand Florida is a little upscale. It had the wooden matches in it. It'd slide mm -hmm. out. You know, so it was uh, kind of representative of... Of, of what the what the resort in those areas were about. So and and we sure talked about this in the past that these were these actually used to be great free souvenirs. You mm. could walk into any of the stores like the Market House on Main Street that actually sold cigarettes or cigars, and they all had themed matchbooks, and all the resorts had themed matchbooks right. because smoking was common through the seventies and eighties. So I, I have quite a collection of these things that I picked up myself. I think uh, probably clear through the nineties, and yep. I yeah. So that was. That was a different time, obviously. Exactly. Now, speaking <laughs> of different times, Hal, uh, I know that Disneyland actually used to have a brazier and hosiery shop. <laughs> well, oh, Wizard of Bras. Yes. It did, did, it was really did called Disneyland that? Ever have that? We, yes. we tried to sell tobacco. You know, they sold tobacco, but did they have, ever have that? No, no, we never no. had that. We never had a Wurlitzer organ store, which mm -hmm. I think was obviously a huge misstep. You know, nothing like going on vacation and just putting a Wurlitzer in the back of the truck on your way. Right, but again, that's the that's the difference between the uh, the market being mostly locals in Southern right. California 
versus the uh, versus the more of the like United States world traveler market in Florida. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it wasn't until the rise of the marketplace that we we got some of these other kind of interesting uh, upscale fashion stores. So. Right. I was almost going to say that the Main Street USA of the early days was almost a precursor to what uh, downtown Disney and Springs. And yeah, I mean, there was a, a high end antique shop on Main Street when yeah. Disney World opened. Yeah, and, you know, let's see. We had and a lot of stuff that was typical touristy stuff, like the candle shop, and uh, we had the Hallmark store that we talked about, which right. became a Gibson store later on. So there were there were some of the longstanding uh, uh, per- participants that came over from Disneyland. But yeah, it was uh, and and at, at that time, and this is another thing that people don't realize uh, in the seventies, all, all throughout the eighties. A lot of the merchandise locations were incredibly unique. If you went into Adventureland at any of the stores there. Um, it was very specific, oh, yeah. uh, adventurous mer- Like you could get saf- like outfits that you would wear on a safari, right? And handcrafted stuff from Africa. It was is it wasn't all just you know Disney merchandise. Uh, one of for the a tips, very long time. Yeah, one of the tips I had in the book that I wrote for for listeners who don't know, I I, I was the author of uh, the very unofficial guide to Walt Disney World, which then became Walt Disney World Made Simple up through about the early two thousands. Uh, one of the tips when I wrote that in the nineties was actually if you see something that you like in the parks, buy it because the chances of you finding it somewhere else were going to be very, very difficult. That that tip does not obviously doesn't apply today or, or it doesn't apply as much because everything's labeled Disney parks and you, you see something somewhere, you're probably going to pick it up somewhere else too. So, yep. But see, look at that, Mike. You, you tweeted up a, a matchbooks. We went through the history of some of the we went to all different corners of <laughs> of merchandising just from pictures of matchbooks. So, so how has the biggest collection of matchbooks out of everybody here? I don't know. Do you have? Uh, well, I don't know. We'll we'll have to have. I'll a, have to take a I, I've only down. Flips, so. I don't have any. I, only so. have, I think I have one or two. So. I probably have six or seven. Yeah, I think you win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So see that, folks. Just by sending in a photo, you have prompted us to go off on all sorts of historical tangents. So if you have any photos of anything, uh, JT, where can they reach us? Send it to us. Uh, podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. dot com. That's right. Or tweet at us at retro wdw. Um, guys, I also want to give it a, sh- a shout out to two people this month too. Uh, I want to thank Michelle Quenzel. Uh, she's got a, a, a blog out there called Looking Back at Tomorrow, and uh, she's working on um, uh, documenting as well as preserving a lot of the history of Horizons. And uh, she gave us a nice nod for our Mesa Verde University collection that we offer, and um, give her a shout out out there. She's got some. Uh, Recently, just did uh, a big post on all sorts of uh, blueprints that she's got. So, just wanted to thank her and uh, help her out there if she needs it. Make, make sure you check out her uh, her website. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, looking back at tomorrow at Blogspot. So, you can check that out. Uh, I also want to give uh, George Taylor a nod from Imaginerding dot com. Um, just a, he uh, went through one of our films and <clears throat> picked it out frame by frame. Uh, it's actually the nineteen seventy one pristine film that uh, Brian found. Uh, um, going back almost two years ago now. And that's how a lot of this, uh, what we're doing today started and how our, some of our relationships formed. And uh, George went through it uh, different frames and called out a lot of different really neat aspects of it. Uh, so you can check him out. It's at Emerging Nerding. And I think he's got it cross-posted on some other sites as well. Um, but George is going to come and uh, do some articles for us in, in the near future. And uh, we'll be announcing more of that in, in the coming months. So Well, it's that time uh, for the Audio Rewind. And uh, guys said, did any of you, well, I shouldn't say did any of you, you must have all gotten this month's, right, when you listened to it? Uh, Yeah. This is the first one I got. You got it. Okay. All right. Good. JT? I Yeah, I I had a pretty decent idea. I guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't born in 1982. Yeah. I know. I really don't know. That's it. You, you, are, you guys are the epitomes of tomorrow's child. Yeah, they yes. really are. Aren't they? Not me. I was, that, that's the first version I heard was tomorrow's that's child. That's true. That's true. Uh, now, how I know you, I know you knew it. So let's let's take a listen real quick. All right, so the answer there is is the part of the song of Tomorrow's Child that uh, was played when your time travel vehicle uh, rotates and you begin to look up at the uh, the planetarium at the top of Space at Birth. Now, 
what's really interesting is we, we received a lot of people who'd said tomorrow's trial, but um, it was interesting that on the LP of Epcot Center that came out in the in the mid '80s, that song or that portion that we that we just played was actually put at the end of Tomorrow's Child, where in the ride it actually played before Tomorrow's Child started. So my question, and and while the, everybody wrote in was correct because they know the LP, is that a separate piece, and was it joined into Tomorrow's Child? Uh, at the end, or are we just hearing the end, which should have been the beginning as you go down the ride? How? So that's an interesting question because that piece of music is a transitional piece mm-hmm. uh, that actually gets you from the tune that's playing previously into Tomorrow's Child. Right. Um, so in theory, <clears throat> you could probably sequence, they would have played over each other okay uh in sync so you 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 could in theory sequence it either at the beginning or the end as long as you lined it up in the right place uh it w- would match it up yeah i mean to in in our minds of course it's you know that's what you see up in the planetarium and then it transitions into tomorrow's child so i don't know why they would have flipped it the other way other than maybe they just wanted to uh just yeah have the vocal part of it as we debate this, we'll go on and we'll eventually get to you guys a, a correct answer. But anybody, so, who, let me ask: Do you know the answer to the question? Uh, I, I do not. That's why I posed it tonight. <laughs> we've asked a question with no answer. We, we've asked a question with no answer. However, we are accepting answers of tomorrow's child, and uh, people have also said when you reach the apex and spaceship breath. So those were all valid answers. And we do have a, a, a winner this month. And, and Brian, you're giving away the uh, fan anniversary pet presents, uh, pennants we, this month. Pennants uh, from both the 2012 and 2014 D23 fan anniversary events that they did around the country. So the only way to get one of these is if you attended one of the events in those cities, those limited cities that they did. So the winner this month will be getting uh, both the 2012 and 2014 pennants. Yep. And the winner this month is Joel Wartko. Congratulations, Joel. Yeah, Joel. Thanks. Joel, give them a good home. That's right. Proudly display them. We'll get those out to you. Um, <clears throat> we do have a uh, a prize for this month. We're going to take a listen to this month's audio rewind, and uh, we'll tell you what the prize is in just a second. All right, so if you know the answer to this month's audio rewind, send your answers to podcast at RetroDisneyWorld.com. A random winner will be drawn from all the correct entries to receive this month's prize. And uh, please submit your entries on or before March 14th, 2016. So, Brian, you want to tell them what we've got this month? Our guest tonight, Tom Nabby, who is the author of uh, Disneyland's Tom Sawyer to Disney Legend, The Adventures of Tom Nabby a 48-year employee of the Disney Company. Uh, an autographed copy of his book uh, will go to the winner of this month's trivia question. Excellent. So again, if you know, send your entries to podcast at RetroDisneyWorld.com and have those entries in or on or before March 14th, 2016. And all entries will be entered into the big prize drawing in December 2016. Now, JT, you have been keeping track and uh, I just caught JT off here a little no, bit, good. taking a swig. You're good? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, JT, you have been keeping track of, of the prizes. So, if, for those listeners who don't know, each month we are adding something to the prize pot. Uh, so far, we have uh, how you, you've got the, uh, the the Orange Bird Yo-Yo, I believe, was the first item to go in. Um, That's right. What else do we have, uh, the, JT? The last uh, month, was... the World of Motion brochure. The World of Motion brochure. That's right. And this month, you are adding. I am adding, um, I picked this little beauty up. This is a golf resort uh, golf bag tag. It's hard plastic. It's got the ears, you know, the world logo. And then on the back, it says golf resort, your name and your rack number. And it has never been written on. It is red. I almost want to keep this for myself. But that is a beautiful very, piece. Very cool. I like the, the it's the vintage Disney world logo. So All right. that so- will be this month's. So as long as you enter the contest, whether your answer is right or wrong, you will be entered into the big prize drawing for December 2016. So do write in a guest to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. 
All right, well, it's time for the main topic uh, of this month's podcast. We have a very special guest uh, this month. Uh, he's one of the Disney legends. And I'm going to let Brian, who, who's done a little bit of research and, and talked to our guests already, kind of give us a, a quick background of who we're talking to tonight. Uh, and then we'll introduce him to the show. So, Brian, I know you've got some um, certain a couple things you wanted to go over and a little bit of background uh, about our guest. All right, Todd, uh, tonight we're talking to Tom Nabby, whose career with Disney began as a child, uh, selling newspapers at the entrance to Disneyland during its construction. Uh, and uh, But for a brief period of service in the United States Marine Corps, it concluded in 2003 when he retired as the manager of distribution services for Walt Disney World. Along the way, he had a hand in most aspects of the building the theme parks that we love, including a vital role in both the Magic Kingdom and Epcot Center when they were being constructed and opened. And tonight we're talking to him about his experiences during his 40-year career, 40-plus year career with the Disney Corporation. And uh, he chronicles a lot of the tales from that time in his new book, From Disneyland's Tom Sawyer to Disney Legend, The Adventures of Tom Nabby which you can get on his website, TomNabby.com or WaltHiredMe.com. Uh, he was named a Disney legend in 2005. He has a window on Main Street USA, and we are thrilled tonight to welcome Tom Nabby. How are you tonight, Tom? I'm doing fine. All right, we'll start off here. Your website's called WaltHiredMe.com, and you are part of a small group of living Disney legends who were actually hired directly by Walt Disney. Uh, and what's more, it happened for you when you were in grade school. Can you please share that story with us? Okay, so I had uh, I just turned 13 when Walt hired me to be Tom Sawyer on Tom Sawyer's Island. There was about a year prior to that uh, when the when the park opened in uh, July of 1955. Uh, lived about seven tenths of a mile away from Disneyland, and I used to go over on Sunday mornings and sell. Uh, uh, the, the Herald Examiner Sunday paper to the construction employees that were exiting the park on Sunday mornings. Uh, and that's how I met a gentleman by the name of Ray Ahmet. And uh, Ray had ca the Castle News concession on Main Street at Disneyland. Uh, and in there, they, uh, they had stroller and wheelchair rentals and uh, uh, they actually published a paper called the Disneyland News, which was a monthly public, just like your show is a monthly show. It was a monthly uh, publication that told a little bit about the building at Disneyland and future attractions and that. And it sold for 10 cents a copy. Uh, and so I had the, the opportunity uh, to do that. They also had a, a newsstand right out in front as you face the gate on the left hand side on the city hall side. Uh, and they had all the uh, uh, national and local uh, papers. Uh, and I used to help run that form too when they needed a break, uh, which gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of people uh, from publicity. Uh, the manager of publicity, Eddie Meck, used to stop by there every morning and pick up a copy of every newspaper uh, that we had uh, to check any articles that were being written about Disneyland. <laughs> and uh, so I got, got to know him quite well. And anytime they had publicity shots, Eddie would tell a, the camera guy to go, go get that redheaded kid, that, uh, <laughs> that Tom guy, and uh, we'll use him in this shot. Well, one of the shots that I had yeah. uh, was, was uh, uh, Jerry Lewis and Milton Berle were, oh, wow. uh, were uh, visiting the park in August of 1955 and they had had uh, put in the headlines of the Disneyland news uh, and I had the opportunity to take a publicity shot of holding that newspaper uh, between the two of them uh, and then uh, uh, while I was selling newspapers somebody and I, I don't remember who uh, told me that uh, Walt was going to build uh, Tom Sawyer's Island uh, on the island that was in the middle of the rivers of America and uh, I, that I, you look just like Tom Sawyer should ask him for a job. And I thought that was a hell of an idea. Uh, and Walt was in the park quite frequently uh, in, the, uh, in that time. Uh, and so I, uh, I looked up Walt and I introduced myself and I told him I looked just like Tom Sawyer. And I heard he was building Tom Sawyer's Island and he should hire me. And uh, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> 
he said uh, he'd think about it. If he had said no, we wouldn't be having this inter interview. <laughs> but he did. He said he'd think about it. So almost for the next year, anytime I could uh, uh, find Walt and and get close enough to to him to to ask if he was still thinking about hiring me to be Tom Sawyer. And then uh, I was in the in the Penny Arcade. I think it was May of '56. Uh, playing the baseball machine, and a gentleman by the name of Dick Dunas came up and tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, "Tom, come with me." And when Dick says, "Come with me," you don't argue with Dick. You just go with Dick. <laughs> and uh, we went over to to Frontierland, and he was the supervisor of Frontierland, and Walt and uh, Morgan Evans, Bill Evans, the landscape architect for Disneyland, and and Walt Disney World were coming off the island. Walt basically said, do you still want to be Tom Sawyer? And I told him, absolutely, Mr. Disney. He says, well, that's super. And, you know, understand that Walt worked with a lot of kids. So he was pretty comfortable talking with kids. And and uh, uh, it, what was neat with talking with Walt is he'd listen to what you had to say all the way through your your conversation and, and carry on a, a, a two-way conversation with Walt. He didn't poo poo you off or 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 uh, downgrade you or anything. He he just listened to what you had to say and 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 talked to you and and uh, he told me that I needed to get a work permit and a social security card and as soon as that I did that uh, they put me to work as Tom Sawyer. So what did Tom Sawyer do? Uh, and actually, I responded to either Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn, whatever the guests wanted me to be. <laughs> now, I, I didn't respond to Indian Joe or Becky Thatcher. Okay, so, <laughs> but part of the job was uh, they had stocked the rivers of America with uh, bluegill, catfish, and, and sun perch. Uh, and we had fishing poles uh, on the docks that were just adjacent to the uh, Mark Twain landing there in, in Frontierland and had 25 poles on each dock and had uh, little cans put out uh, and nailed to the railing that said worms on them and uh, my job was to keep worms in the can for bait for people that wanted to fish and if they didn't want to bait the hook then part of it was to, uh, 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 to bait the hooks for them uh, and we started out with a catch and clean program and Part of my job was if they wanted to keep the fish, then I would go clean it for them and put it in a plastic bag. But that <laughs> only crazy. lasted maybe, if it, if it lasted two months, uh, I'd be surprised because old dead smelly fish started showing up places that you didn't want old <laughs> dead smelly fish to show up. So we immediately went from a catch and clean to a catch and release uh, program. and and debarb the hooks. So besides taking care of the fishing poles and, and the maintenance of that and, and untangling poles and building new poles, uh, face character uh, posts for a lot of pictures. Uh, so that's what I did all through my junior high school and high school years. You have an amazing story of how you went from uh, from location to location within Disneyland uh, with all the little odd jobs that you do. And I imagine uh, it's because all of those were, were operated by independent vendors at that point, right? It wasn't all owned by Disney at that point yet. Oh, no. Uh, when Disneyland opened up, there's only about 600 or so employees that actually work for Disneyland Incorporated. Uh, and that was the people that operated the rides and attractions, uh, the, uh, the maintenance people and administration. Even security was uh, run by uh, Burns Detective Agency. So uh, uh, all the shops and all the restaurants were operated by what we call it at Disneyland. They call them lessees at Walt Disney World. Uh, they're called participants. Okay. But there are people that have contracts in order to uh, uh, run those facilities. And uh, Disney didn't get into uh, uh, merchandise and food until almost uh, 10 years uh, when the contracts started running out. 
of uh, the people that had uh, 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 signed contracts at the opening at Disneyland. And most of those folks loaned Walt a lot of money <laughs> 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 to build Disneyland. Tom, uh, you were talking about your hiring and you said the magic words for us. Dick Nunes, who eventually was the uh, Parks and Attractions president uh, for the whole company. But uh, uh, and in your time, he was he was uh, one of the executives starting out in Disney Disneyland. And uh, we love a good Dick Nunes story, partially because he's like the white whale for all of us, because he doesn't give interviews and he never wrote a book. And so you hear all these stories secondhand. He's got this fascinating take charge personality. But there's a second uh, piece of that hiring story in your book about when you go to the personnel office uh, with your documents uh, that, oh. that relates to them having to call Dick. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said earlier, Walt, Walt told me I had to get a work permit and a Social Security card. Well, the Social Security card wasn't a, a whole lot of problem. Just went to the Social Security office in Santa Ana and filled out the form and got my Social Security card. But for the work permit, I had to get a form from school. And I had to take it to my employer. And so I took it to the employment office. Uh, and that was located on West Street, just opposite the, the Disneyland Hotel in an old house there that they uh, that was on the property that they just kept and kept it as, as the employment uh, center. So I went in and uh, told the lady there uh, that, uh, you know, my story that Walt had hired me to, to be Tom Sawyer. And I need to have this, this form filled out. And so I could get my work permit. And she asked me to have a seat. And she went in and, and told the manager of, of uh, employment at that time, uh, his name was Chuck Whalen, uh, uh, that, you know, had this kid out here that says, Walt well, hired to be Tom Sawyer, and that Dick Nunes knows all about it. And so Chuck picked up the phone and called Dick. And this side of the story I hear from Dick is that uh, uh, Chuck called Dick and said, hey, I got this kid over here. Uh, that says, uh, you know, we'll hire and be Tom Sawyer. Now, Dick, you know, you know, we don't hire kids. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, basically, Dick uh, sort of cleared his throat a little bit and said, look, Chuck, uh, Walt hired him, so let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> at that point, all my paperwork got filled out, and I was able to get my work permit. <laughs> That's a great story. Uh, since we're mostly focused on the Florida resort, uh, on this, on this show, I want to, I wonder if you could tell us, um, how you came to be one of the employees who transferred from California to Florida. I was in the Marine Corps, unfortunately, during the time that, that Walt passed and during the time of the New York World's Fair. So I, I, I missed that opportunity to go to the New York World's Fair with everybody, uh, to open that up. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the major attractions uh, and openings that I missed uh, in my career. Uh, but when I got back, uh, pretty much started interviewing people uh, to relocate to Florida. And so I went through a round of interviews and I had worked every ride and attraction at Disneyland with the exception of the steam train and the monorail. And the reason being the steam train and monorail were run by Retlaw. And Red Law is Walter spelled backwards. And that was a company that was run, uh, owned by the Disney, Walt Disney family, uh, which is uh, the predecessor of WED, which is the predecessor of, of uh, WDI. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, and they sort of had a little bit of a hiring and uh, things you could do back in that time frame of, of uh, people to work on the monorail. You sort of had to be... Uh, of six foot and fairly slender and I've never been fairly slender <laughs> and I'll never be six foot. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in turn, that's why I hadn't worked uh, uh, either one of those attractions. So uh, after I went through the rounds of interview, uh, uh, Pete Crimmings was, was, was one of my mentors and Pete was the manager of Tomorrowland when I got back. Uh, from the service, and he wanted me to uh, very much uh, uh, interview, and Pete was slotted to go to Florida as the operations manager for transportation, uh, and he wanted me to uh, 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 be his opening supervisor on the monorail system. Uh, so I went through the rounds of interviews, uh, ended up uh, uh, getting promoted, and went into a training program uh, with uh, Redlaw. Uh, for the monorail and, and uh, steam trains. Uh, and uh, they actually uh, uh, 
um, um, modify the costume uh, for me. It was the, the, what we called at that time frame the Captain America uh, costume. It was sort of red, white, and blue uh, uh, costume. And so I looked like this little red, white, and blue barrel. <laughs> uh, walking around uh, in relationship to the rest of the monorail uh, crew and people. Uh, but I trained on the monorail, and then uh, in uh, uh, January, I, I think we got here uh, the end of January, uh, drove cross-country, and, and I actually uh, uh, drove a Volkswagen and towed a Volkswagen, and my wife had put a big sign in the back window of the one Volkswagen that we were towing uh, two more bugs for Florida. Uh, <laughs> so we got a lot of a lot of honks and hoots drove across the country. It took us about six days to to get here. Can you tell us what it was like to arrive in Orlando in 1971? It was a pretty desolate place, wasn't it? Well, uh, uh, if if you if you're familiar with the Orlando area. Uh, civilization pretty much stopped at 33rd Street and I-4. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so uh, that was about halfway from Orlando to Walt Disney World in that area. And uh, uh, when we when we came out here, uh, the, the company had gone into a little bit of a, a, a partnership with Hilton uh, and uh, uh, Hilton had built the Hilton Inn South, which was on International Drive, and International Drive at that time frame was only uh, maybe four or five hundred yards long, uh, and the Hilton was the only thing on it, and there was a gas station on the corner of Sand, uh, Sand Lake and International Drive, uh, and then uh, those of us that got relocated here, uh, we spent, uh, I spent uh, almost 30 days uh, in the in the Hilton. Uh, while we looked for a house, found a house, found a, uh, a a builder in Pine Hills area, and they had some apartment complexes. So we were able to move in there into their apartment complexes while they built our house. I, the the other thing is, people in Florida had no idea what Walt Disney World was. They they uh, uh, you know if, if you look at the demographics and and statistics and that type of thing of, of, of the people that went to Disneyland, only about 13% of the attendance of Disneyland came from the east of the Mississippi. So there weren't a whole lot of people on the east coast. That's one of the reasons that Walt did the New York World's Fair, was to get a feel uh, for the eastern audience and, and to see whether, whether that type of show would go over with the eastern audience. Uh, so uh, uh, New York World's Fair was a little bit of a testing ground uh, for uh, uh, putting a, a new park on the on the east coast of the United States. Uh, but uh, people thought it was was a big big fair, okay? You know, and it was gonna gonna run for a little bit and then shut down and then open back up again. They had no <laughs> idea what 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 Walt Disney World was gonna be. So Tom, your your description of of the Orlando era, area of you know being desolate and not a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure there in the beginning echoes for our listeners echoes back to some of our very early episodes where Brian, I remember you describing in Lake Buena Vista the the wine shop and the the other different things that they bought to the area um, because those things didn't exist in that area. You would have to go out for them. Uh, I'm part of you know the Walt Disney World plan was was creating those things inside the Lake Buena Vista shopping area. Um, I think, Brian, you had mentioned the wine shop in particular, right? Um, yeah, me and Hal both have talked about the development of Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village and how if you really wanted anything like what they sold there, you had to either go to Tampa <laughs> or, or so, like there was just nothing There's in, nothing in there, Central right? Florida around there. Yeah, the, the, there was a very large infrastructure in 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 the Orlando area. The the, the same thing goes with with uh, uh, paint and uh, parts and and repair pieces and everything. So that's why almost everything that we needed to operate Walt Disney World got imported. <laughs> uh, uh, and when I say imported, imported from Southern California. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one one of the running you themes. Know, that, in, you know, okay. that, that first year, I think we hired and fired the the, the population of Orlando at least <laughs> once or twice uh, <laughs> uh, through that entire process. I, 
I I remember the when hunting season opened up, we had the highest rate of absenteeism that we, we had ever ever had. <laughs> it was it was a rural community? There's yeah. no question about it. And there was uh, a lot of people that moved there just for the concern. My uh, I had two family, two a cousin and a brother in law that actually moved from where Georgia and other places to move down to Orlando to work on construction because it was such a huge project. And they needed skilled workers. So we had two people in our family who moved down to work on it. So, yeah, there was a lot of transplants because there wasn't enough locals that were skilled to do the job. When I got here, the monorail was running a little behind. Uh, so I sort of got involved in the parking lot until the parking lot supervisor got here. And then I sort of got involved in watercraft for a little bit until the watercraft supervisor got here. But once the, the, everybody got on board, uh, then I was pretty much focused on the monorail. It's so uh, ironic that um, you you operated everything in Disneyland except for the railroad and the monorail. And then you get moved to Walt Disney World and get put in charge of the monorail. <laughs> the yes. one thing that you didn't operate while well, you're actually at <laughs> Disneyland. That was my job here at, at uh, Walt Disney World, was to open uh, uh, the monorail system. Hi, everyone. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. We're now embarking on a scenic journey over the highway in the sky. We'll be traveling nonstop directly to the Magic Kingdom, so we ask that you remain seated at all times, and no smoking, please. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. Today, you'll be seeing what we call Phase 1, which stretches more than three miles east to west and two miles north to south. So you open the monorail. Uh, yeah. what, what were the differences? You know, you had trained a little bit on Disneyland. What were the differences between the Disneyland and the Disney World monorails? Well, the, the, the Disneyland monorails were, were a all-wig uh, design, and uh, they, they were pretty much designed to run in one direction. Uh, they would back up, but very, you had to back them up very slowly. Uh, if you if you exceeded one or two miles an hour, uh, you would uh, 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 derail uh, the bus bar connectors that, mm -hmm. that transferred uh, power to the train. Well, the, the monorails at Walt Disney World were designed to operate in both directions. Uh, they did have a front cab and they did have a back cab. Uh, but uh, uh, in turn, they go uh, in either direction, uh, same speed. Uh, the, the bus bar pickups uh, were on uh, one uh, negative on one side of the rail and positive on the other side of the rail and little paddles that sat down and ran against the bus bar uh, to pick up uh, the 600 volts DC in order to operate the trains. But that's just the beginning. We have many exciting plans for the future. Walt Disney World covers 43 square miles. That's about twice the size of the island of Manhattan. The, the, the trains were, were, were diesel, electric, locomotive drive system for the motors. And an automotive uh, uh, drive for the uh, axles and tires and wheels and everything else. So it's a little bit of a combination of a, of a, uh, uh, a general electric train and a general motors truck. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then throw together on top of that an uh, aircraft uh, sandwiched uh, aluminum uh, body. So, and they, <laughs> and they were designed in house by Bob Gurr. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And uh, they were uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, fabricated and shipped into Martin and assembled at Martin Marietta. All the beams, uh, uh, if, if you look at the beams on the monorail, uh, the ones that, that are curved on the bottom, not the straight beams, but the ones that have, have an arch to them, mm -hmm. those were, were uh, fabricated in Tacoma, Washington, and shipped here by rail, and mm -hmm. offloaded and tapped, and then they put them onto a, a, a truck, and then the, the truck was sort of like the old a uh, uh, tractor or ladder truck that the fire department had, and the there was a guy on the back that would steer the back bogey. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 what you had is a cab and the front of the beam, and then you had nothing, and then you had a bogey on the back, okay, and a guy on the back steering the bogey. Uh, wow. the and the beams were were pretty much uh, between 100 and 110 feet. 
Out on the Seven Seas Lagoon and Bay Lake, you can see some of the boating and water sports activities. But what you can't see from our monorail are things like golf courses, campgrounds, nature trails, tennis courts, the Polynesian Village Resort, and just about everything else for a family vacation. Was there any reason for the curve design versus the versus yeah, the straight? Yeah, they're, they're stressed. Ah, and, okay. And, and, and what you have is, is the beam isn't solid concrete. It's got a, a foam core, and then there's stainless steel tubes in there, and then inside the stainless steel tubes, there are cables uh, in that. And if, 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 if you look at a section of the monorail beam, there's six beams make up a section. Mm -hmm. And that section, in turn, is all tied together. And what they did is, is they they welded those cables together, and then they stressed them so they would pull an arc up, okay, and made one solid beam out of the six wow. uh, together. And every six beams, there's an expansion joint. Yeah. Okay, so the expansion joint will, will swell and and and, and close together. So. Uh, 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 that's the that's a little bit now. The two beams that are on the north end of the Contemporary Hotel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they didn't make it to Florida uh, <laughs> on their on their first attempt. The train <laughs> turned right and the beams went left. <laughs> the middle the middle of winter uh, and it snowed and they couldn't find the beams because <sighs> of the snow. Oh, uh, and in turn, they had to refabricate them. Uh, so we, we we were almost three months late closing the loop uh, because we had to wait for those two beams to be fabricated and shipped to finally c uh, complete the whole uh, circuit for the monorail. So somewhere, someone listening to this is going to say, hey, where did those two beams fall and can we go find them somewhere on the side <laughs> of a train track? Uh, they, they, they eventually found them, but they had to wait for spring thaw. And okay. you couldn't, couldn't wait until the end of spring and they went, you know, uh, uh, jacked them out with, you know, uh, jackhammers and hauled them away. And you say <laughs> in the book you can actually feel those two beams when you're on the monorail? Yeah, the, the, the camber on the, on the beams are, are slightly off. Uh, so when you're headed, headed to the, the, the Magic Kingdom out of the Contemporary Hotel, you'll feel the train do a little bit of a, an adjustment to the right because uh, uh, the beams are cambered for the wow. turn. Right. Interesting. Wow. Looking back on the water side, the white sandy beach is the beginning of our own Tropic Island Resort here in Walt Disney World the Polynesian Village. The village is all nestled around a South Seas Harbor, complete with native outrigger canoes, waterfalls, luau's, and plenty of Tahitian dancing. You're invited to return and visit the islanders anytime during our operating hours, simply by taking the local monorail trains from the Magic Kingdom station. They'll drop you off right here at the Polynesian Village. Did you ever see the wave machine work? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, and, and Dick actually rode a couple waves uh, on the wave machine before he finally gave up and he had, he had to give up because it was pushing the island back and it was eroding uh, yeah that's that's what Su that's what sully says in his book that if they had kept running it there wouldn't have been an island left there anymore <laughs> well, yeah. it was like like how big were the waves he was riding like uh, uh, maybe maybe a uh, uh two three footer if that okay wow Oh, yeah. And you were a surfer, so you could legitimately tell us the wave size and know from from watching it. Oh yeah, yeah, it was it was right there. You know, it was on the old Polynesian beach. You know, I'm I, I was sort of looking at some old photos the other day, and now with all the houses that are built along along the beach there at the, at the Polynesian, that has taken a whole different uh, look and and concept. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, uh, parts of the wave machine are still out there. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I believe, I don't think they've, they totally tore it, tore it out. I think some of it's still under the, under the water out there. <laughs> Do you know it's if like, there's, was there any footage ever taken for promotional or anything that you can recall that, because that's kind of like one of our Holy grails is to find some sort of footage of it uh, in action. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if there was any, any footage yeah the, the the problem being is a lot of that stuff uh because we move so much and change spots and change positions uh, things got lost in the archives so right 
Yeah, I'm 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 not sure uh, if even if there was footage, if you could find it. Interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, so the, Tom, the quest for the Grail will continue. Incidentally, you can take the world cruise over both the lake and lagoon aboard old-fashioned side-wheel steamships. You'll find them docked at the Magic Kingdom entrance. So, so my my other favorite Dick Nunes story in the book involves that monorail loop. Your first ride around the monorail loop with him. Can you share that with everybody? Oh yeah, that was a, a that, <laughs> yeah that was a, a late August, early September. Uh, we finally had a, a complete loop, uh, and we uh, we brought a brought a train out from the from the uh, train storage out onto the main line, uh, and closed everything up and. And started around on a loop, and Dick, Dick was on the train, and uh, uh, Dave Gingenbach, uh, who is the uh, uh, engineer uh, that was putting the trains together, uh, he eventually ran Wed Maple for for a while, but but Dave was driving, um, uh, Dick was riding, uh, I was on the train, uh, a couple of my uh, assistant supervisors were on the train, uh, uh, Greg Emmer and and uh, Bill Cheney, uh, and we went uh, uh, through the uh, 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 Magic Kingdom station and headed on around past the Polynesian uh, and uh, in through the, the TTC station and headed up to the Contemporary Hotel. Just ahead is one of the real wonders of our world, the exciting Contemporary Resort. In a few seconds, we'll be passing directly through the center of the Contemporaries Tower Building for a look at the spectacular Grand Canyon Concourse. And we pulled into the Contemporary Hotel, and and uh, we stopped there for a minute, and and Dick sort of leaned over everybody and says, "Hey, look, uh, you know, have you done a weight test on this train?" And they said, "No, we haven't yet." And he says, "Okay, well, I tell you what, I'm going to do." And what he did is he invited all the construction workers that were in the Contemporary Hotel to go for a train ride. <laughs> and and his whole his whole philosophy there was that if I invite you and put you on the train and go on around, that you'll you you won't stop work every time you see a train coming through because you've already ridden it. <laughs> and so uh, we filled up that. That was probably the most amount of weight that was ever on uh, has ever been on a monorail. <laughs> We filled that train up and we made one loop and came back with the with, with the guys uh, and offloaded them in the Contemporary Hotel. But that was uh, that was sort of a, a condition by fire type of uh, scenario. <laughs> As we ride through the Grand Canyon Concourse, you can see one of the largest ceramic murals ever created. It's nine stories high and it's made up of eighteen thousand hand painted tiles. Elevators running through the center will carry you high above to the top of the world restaurant where famous stars entertain. The one part of the book that made me gasp, Tom, I've, there are many times where my mind has wandered and I've thought, oh, I wonder if I could ride a bicycle around the monorail beams. But you actually walked the beams several times like during the course of construction. Yeah, U.S. Steel was a real pain in the uh, in, in the posterior to, to to work with to try to get past their uh, uh, checkpoints, and, and and part of the job was to uh, to in, ensure that all the owner furnished items were properly installed in the stations in that area, uh, and uh, you know the the Polynesian was real close. Dang, I could walk you know uh, over there. Uh, but try to get through the checkpoint was a real pain. So the the beam is thirty inches wide. So and, you know that's the size of of a of a uh, a normal sized desk. Uh, you know and and uh, so the, the the only thing you don't want to do is be real close to somebody walking in front of you because their cadence throws you off a little bit <laughs> and gives you a little bit of a, a, a motion sickness. You always let the person get far enough ahead where you can't see them walk. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I used to go from uh, uh, to the uh, uh, MEC, um, um, which is um, uh, Main Entrance Complex uh, Station, which was at the parking lot. And I used to walk over to the poly, which that was a real short walk, uh, check that station out, make sure everything was going fine, 
and then from there walk up into the contemporary. Couldn't go out on the other side of the contemporary because there weren't any beams. In there. Right, they weren't there yet. <laughs> they had not to that. And, and, and sent yet. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, as long as the wind wasn't blowing <laughs> and, and there wasn't an electrical storm close, no big deal. Now, once we started operating trains, you got a little bit of a a a, 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 a pulsing and and wind buffering from the from the train if you walk on the beam uh, when the trains were operating. So it was a whole <laughs> little different uh, uh, sensation. Wow. But, uh, you know, that stuff you can't do today. You can see many of the guest rooms high in the sloping walls overlooking the restaurant terrace and shopping plaza below. In addition to the Towers building, the Contemporary Resort also features lakeside living. Additional guest rooms are located right on the shores of beautiful Bay Lake. You mentioned U.S. Steel. Did you see any of the, the, the sliding of the drawers into the buildings, the contemporary oh, yeah. matter? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, when, when, I, when I took over the warehouse operation, one of the warehouse buildings was, was, was the old U.S. Steel building, which is DC-6, which is by the, the ball fields. And that's where all the rooms for the contemporary, for the Polynesian, uh, and for the golf resort and a hotel that was built up uh, uh, on uh, 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 528 and I-4 called the Court of Flags were all fabricated uh, in that building. And, and pretty much uh, it came together and they, they had a big uh, uh, train track right down the middle of it. And they would, you know, build the, build the, the floor and then they put the walls up and then drop the ceiling down on the room and finish it up and take it down to the end of the building to take it out and load it on a flatbed truck and haul it over and install it. It seemed like they, they knew what they were doing with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, if, you know, the, 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 supposedly the original concept was when it came time for rehab and that is, is you would just go slide all the rooms out and put new rooms in. OK, right. uh, but that never really materialized. Uh, <laughs> I think that was somebody's uh, uh, dream, uh, 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 sort of like the future uh, uh, world. Of when, when we when we had our discussion about this uh, construction process and that and that warehouse and I, did they slide those in? Were they fully decorated, like with the carpets and the furniture and everything in them? Or did they load all that in after they put the room in place? No, the, 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 when the room came out of out of the U.S. Steel building for installation, everything was in the room. <laughs> That's, wow. Fascinating. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, fascinating. There you go. That's fascinating. And, 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 and they went in, in in pairs, and and they were back to back because of the plumbing. Oh, okay, yeah, so, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So so what you had is a pipe chase. Yep, got it. And now, as we approach the station, please check for all your personal belongings and remain seated until the train comes to a complete stop. We ask that everyone disembark at this point. The doors will open automatically to the right of the train. When you leave, please lower your head and watch your step. Thank you for joining us on the Walt Disney World monorail, and I hope you have a pleasant stay in the Magic Kingdom. Again, may we ask that everyone disembark at this station. One of our episodes, we talked with a former riverboat captain who had told us and how found some concept artwork to back this up that originally there was thought of using the Admiral Joe Fowler, I guess it was, right? Uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, taking it out of the rivers of America at night and sailing it down the water pageant channel and out into Seven Seas Lagoon and using it for nighttime cruises to entertain the hotel guests. Nowhere did I uh, remember that. In order to do that, you had, you had, the, swing, you had the swing bridge and, and, and you actually had a, a differential of the water level in the rivers of America to the light boat channel. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you had a lock and ways type of, of situation. So in order to do that was, uh, that took uh, a day to set that all up in order to move it in and out. So, so uh, whoever, whoever was thinking that was, uh, have one of them dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because you do tell a story about uh, moving the boat into the uh, the channel. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. My boss, uh, uh, Pete, he says he says, Tom, how high is that beam? And I said, 
Pete, I don't know. And he, he <laughs> says, well, we're, we're, we're moving the, 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 the fowler in and, and, uh, uh, they got the stacks on it. So we need to be able to clear the beam. <laughs> and, uh, so got a, a big ball of twine and a, and a pretty good sized nut, uh, and, uh, went out on top of the beam and tossed it over and tied off where, where the, the nut hit the water in the top of the beam and then took it back up the office and measured it out. And, and I, 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 I don't remember what it was, but we had like 10 feet clearance for the, for, 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 for the stacks. As long as there was no wave that came through, you were fine. Yeah. yeah. I think our uh, captain told us that the top of the stacks you could pull off and sort of like tilt them back if you needed to get under. And he, he thought that they did that when they brought it in in order to get it under. But it, it sounds like there was more than enough room. Well, uh, originally, yeah, they, they would, they, they could come in and pick them up and take them off, but they had put them on and they were moving the boat over and, and they had forgot either that, to, that they were going to take them off or whatever. So yeah. it was one of those, they had already installed them and got them in mm. place and everything was, was measured out and said, yeah, it did clear fine until they put the stacks on. <laughs> okay. And, and so it was one of those, well, we got the stacks on, will it clear? Gotcha. So, yeah. so when you stopped uh, walking along the monorail beams, uh, there is an implement to retrieve things from the monorail beams that carries your moniker now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, you're talking about the nabby grabbers. The nabby grabber, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a little tool that, that uh, the Custodio people use to pick up trash and that. And uh, what, what we had was, was uh, people dropping things down into the monorail trough. Uh, and that's back when we had a lot of ticket, booths, uh, ticket books and that. But they dropped their wallets. They dropped their purses. Uh, the only thing they didn't drop in there were their kids. <laughs> but, but they dropped almost everything you could conceive of down uh, into the monorail trough. And, and there's, a, there's about a four inch clearance between the, uh, the, the side of the train and the, and, and the trough. And there's a trough at the uh, at, at MEC station, which is, which is a, a ticket and transportation center and the Magic Kingdom station and the Contemporary. Okay, the Polynesian was wide open, so there wasn't any any trough at the Polynesian. So in order to retrieve something, okay, you had to move the train out of the station. You had to turn off the power. Somebody had to jump down in the trough and retrieve whatever was in the trough, okay, and then you turn everything back on. Well, that took quite a bit of time in order to do that. So uh, I kept looking at these little uh, uh, trash picker uppers and, and I went down to uh, custodian, saw Roy Young, manager of uh, custodio at that time. And, and uh, he gave me a, 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 a dozen of them and I took them back to the monorail shop and I said, Hey, you know, what I want you to do is extend these things out to eight foot long and understand we got 600 volts DC uh, you know, running on the bus bars, so don't want to electrocute anybody, but want to be able to use them, uh, insulate them, and to pick things out of the the the, uh, the monorail trough, and uh, that saved a lot of things. Well, what happened is, as as the people left, they had called them navy grabbers, okay. And as the people left the monorail and went other places in the park, those, those little trash picker uppers really didn't have a name. And so it, it sort of evolved that they were called the Navy Grabbers. <laughs> and they're called that to this day. Uh, yeah, my understanding. Now, there, there is a company that's called Nab, uh, Nabster Grabber. Okay. Uh, that I, I, I don't know if that came before or after. So, got it, got it. So, for the rest of the uh, 70s, you'd worked in attractions in the Magic Kingdom, right? For Frontierland yeah. and Adventureland. And yeah, what, what's, once we opened the monorail and went, and then the decision was made to uh, 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 build Tom Sawyer's Island and the Rivers of America, uh, I sort of had a little bit of expertise in there. Uh, so, I went from the monorail. 
uh, to the construction of Tom Sawyer's Island and the uh, uh, Richard F. Irvine. Those two things opened basically the same time in, in 1973. Um, and then I sort of got tagged as a nuts and bolts guy because I went from there to uh, Tomorrowland uh, while we built Space Mountain, uh, Wedway, uh, People Mover, and Star Jets. <clears throat> and so went through that construction and training and developing everybody uh, through that opening. And, and then after we opened Space Mountain, the decision was to uh, uh, enclose the, the uh, 20,000 leagues and chlorinate it. Originally, 20,000 leagues wasn't an enclosed system and was not chlorinated. Uh, mm -hmm. They pumped water out of the aquifer right into 20,000 leagues. And then from there, it went from the moat. And from the moat, it went into the Jungle Cruise. From the Jungle Cruise, it went into Rivers America. <laughs> the Rivers America went into Lipo Channel. The Lipo Channel it went into Seven Seas Lagoon. From the Seven Seas Lagoon, it went out in the, the 55 miles of, of uh, canal uh, that's out out there. So, so Tom, you're, you're you're mentioning of the of the water coming right from the aquifer. We have a very early film um, from November 1971 of the Magic Kingdom, and the water in Twenty Thousand Leagues is just crystal clear. I mean, it's gorgeously clear. Looks like you could drink it. So, uh, yeah, well, you probably could. <laughs> the, 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 the problem the problem being is that it had good flow in some areas, but didn't have real go good flow in other areas, mm -hmm. and the algae started growing and and so what would happen is the divers would have to go down every morning and clean the portholes on the submarines uh scrub the mermaids uh and scrub the fish off and that's why the decision was made to to chlorinate it so uh went through that and then we opened that up in 70 uh 76 i think is when we came back up from rehab and I went from there back to Frontierland Liberty Square because we were going to build an attraction called Big Thunder. <laughs> okay, so I went through the Big Thunder operation. They actually built Big Thunder at Disneyland before they built it here at Walt Disney World. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go out to Disneyland and uh, uh, train on Big Thunder out there. So I had firsthand experience of operating Big Thunder at, at Disneyland. And just about that time frame, they started interviewing people to go on the Epcot project. And uh, uh, Norm Durgis uh, 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 called me in for an interview and wanted to know if I had an interest in, in being involved in the, uh, in the Epcot project. Uh, Norm was working for Sully at that time and Orlando Ferrani and uh, Marty Sklar. So right. that whole whole envelopment. So uh, I ended up uh, uh, transferring from Walt Disney World to WED uh, uh, for the uh, uh, what what we called the PICO team. And the PICO team, PICO is an acronym for, for a Project Installation Coordination Office is what PICO stands for. And Orlando Ferrani uh, developed PICO uh, when they built the New York World's Fair. And what you did is you took people from the operating side of the business. They were the coordinators and, and gophers. And for everybody, uh, when they built the attraction, they would train everybody. And then they would operate the attraction when it opened up to the public. Uh, so that was the, the cycle. Well, I thought I was going to end up being a, a, a pavilion coordinator. Well, uh, Norm had other thoughts. Norm... <laughs> Norm, Norm wanted me to uh, uh, develop inventory tracking system uh, for everything that we manufactured or bought for show installation uh, called OFI, Owner Furnished Items. And uh, we gave them all a tracking number. Uh, and it was uh, 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 an example would be a, a show would be built in Tahunga in the, in the show facility in Tahunga. Uh, and the art directors would come in and walk through the show and everything and buy off on it. And then they would disassemble the entire show, load it on a truck, and send it to Florida. Okay. Well, every piece was numbered. Okay. So you had this big, gigantic puzzle. 
And it used to be real interesting because the, the truck would get here and you'd open the back of the truck and you'd go, well, how the hell did they get that on there? And then <laughs> how am I going to get it off without breaking it? And if it's broken, then I got to make sure it's fixed before it, it gets installed. And, and some of the product went directly to the site. So I had a, a crew of folks that would meet and direct the trucks and have them uh, delivered to the show sites. Or we would meet and greet the trucks and offload them in the warehouse and store them for uh, a future delivery. So this is the early 1980s. So do you have any computers at this point? Or is this all just done pencil and paper in hand and you just tr- figuring out as best you can where everything needs to go? Uh, it's it's just making that transition from what, if I say tub files, you know what tub files yep, were? Yep. Okay. Okay. Making the transition from tub files to electronics. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, everything was still pretty much in a batch mode. Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you, you did all your information and it got loaded in uh, every night uh, into the system on a batch load. And oh hopefully that hopefully that the batch didn't fail and you didn't lose <laughs> holding all the information you loaded <laughs> in on that day. But we we, we developed a, a a very good uh, uh, inventory tracking system, better than what the Walt Disney World Company had for inventory tracking uh, for sales of merchandise, food, and general supplies, <laughs> uh, which was which was sort of neat. Uh, so, uh, actually, actually handled about four hundred million dollars worth of uh, materials, uh, and uh, 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 pretty much were able to reconcile everything. Do you do you have a wild guess as to how many pieces you actually trafficked between California and Florida? Oh, I mean, boy. hundreds of thousands, I would think, right? Close to uh, a half a billion pieces. Wow. Uh, if, if, if you got into that, but, uh, uh, no, I, 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 that's one statistic. I don't remember <laughs> you know, we, we tracked a whole lot of square footage and, and, uh, uh, cube footage and, and that type of thing, but I don't remember tracking individual pieces. So, so every piece that went into every attraction, every pavilion, every merchandise location, when I say merchandise, I mean the actual fittings of it and everything, they all went through your warehouse? Uh, pretty much so, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, 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 and you have to put that line in there as, as OFI, owner furnished items, and they had to be installed by uh, Buena Vista Construction. Okay. So when you when you open the so, back of those trucks, what's the most interesting thing that you saw? Oh, one of them was was uh, <laughs> guy came in and he says, "Yep, yep." First of all, the drivers didn't have a whole lot of responsibility, and they were air ride trucks. And he says, "Whatever was in there when I was coming across the causeway uh, in Baton Rouge, it came loose." <laughs> he said, "He said I can feel it." And it was it was one of the it was a the uh, a simulated steam train in the uh, uh, transportation uh, pavilion. And it, it got banged up a little bit, but not bad. Uh, we were able to get it off and get it uh, painted and repaired and put back in the place. But, you know, understand it's, it, it was one of a kind. Now, uh, you, you know, you get into all the kitchen equipment and that type of thing, that's, that's, that, that's a little different story. So all the china, all the kitchen equipment, all the chairs, all the tables, all that stuff. Uh, I, I, I remember one truck came in, and it was carpet. Okay, and and uh, you know I I said we had numbers for everything. Well, they failed to put the numbers on the pieces of carpet. They put them in an envelope. Okay, so I had <laughs> I had this envelope full of tracking numbers for every piece of carpet that was on the on the truck. And what we had to do is just <laughs> take it off and measure the carpet. And then what they had done is they had cut the carpet to fit exactly in the rooms that right. it was going into. Okay. So then we had to, and then we were able to get back and tag and identify each piece of carpet with its tracking number. And then we rolled it back up and put it in the warehouse. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's one of those challenges that, that, that you have. Every day must have been like a new adventure. Like what? Do I, what problem do I have to solve now? 
<laughs> now, now it's not in the book, but you told the story at Epcot 30 about uh, running out of time when they were building Spaceship Earth. Oh yeah, that 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 envelope got real uh, uh, tight, and they needed to get the uh, the exterior uh, skin on Spaceship Earth, so they had to close it up. And uh, what we did is we loaded everything in to Spaceship Earth early from the bottom, and if you look at Spaceship Earth. Earth, it's a it's a big helix, like a big screw. Mm-hmm. Okay, and when you get up when you get up to the top, then you sort of went right down through the center. So we loaded everything into the top, and then the last set that went in was the first set to be installed down at the bottom. Okay, and so they finished building the track and everything, and then we started moving the set pieces. In. Oh my gosh! So everything was staged, just like up in the top, waiting to go into place later on. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. incredible. So oh, yeah. that that's that is there's a lot of room up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And apparently nothing is ever coming out of there again, ever. <laughs> uh, well, I, I I I wouldn't say that. I would say somewhere along the line, you know, the, you know, uh, things change all the time. So uh, uh, I would say somewhere along the line, somebody will design it and figure out how to get it in there. <laughs> you you talk in the book about. As soon as Epcot opened, uh, which was like a soft open for you because you were still building Horizons and a bunch of other stuff after yeah, the park too. opened. Um, but you said the culture changed almost immediately from like whatever you need, go, 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 just buy it to almost instant austerity. Is that is that accurate? Oh, yeah. 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 I, uh, uh, before Epcot opened, I could pretty much authorize a, a, a jet plane <laughs> if, <laughs> if, 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 if we had to get it here uh, but uh, once Epcot opened up uh, uh, I, I couldn't get pencils without a vice president's signature <laughs> on, a, on a wreck that's how tight things got uh, uh, at that time frame yeah Epcot was a very very uh, uh, changing point for the entire company uh, 80 84 when you go through that that was that was one of those that you didn't know from day to day if you're going to have a job or not right that was the change in leadership at the top yeah and so did you expect to move out of the warehouse once epcot was done or yes i i i figured i'd go back into the operating side of the business uh and but in turn when everything changed and all the restructure and everything came through uh, Norm sort of asked me, you know, uh, what would I like to do? And I told him I sort of liked the warehouse uh, business. And I, you know, I've learned a lot, uh, but there's a lot more to learn. And I was able uh, to make that adjustment uh, and to go into the support side of the business. So 25 years on the rides and attraction side of the business. And then uh, the last 22 years of my career was in uh, uh, warehousing and distribution. So, so did you play this, a similar role for Disney MGM and the Animal Kingdom in terms of the set pieces coming through your warehouse? And yeah, but I, uh, uh, other people did that part of the job. That was okay. one of the guys that worked for me uh, for, on Epcot. Uh, pretty much uh, stayed with Wed and handled uh, all the owner furnished items for the future projects. Uh, and we had a, a warehouse. Well, we uh, I guess they still do in Kissimmee. Uh, we used to call it a good junk warehouse uh, <laughs> because we, we never throw anything away, and that's right. where all and that's where all the project material goes through. And 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 when you get into into projects, it's sort of a strange little thing. Uh, uh, there's this this thing called attic stock. Uh, so for every hundred tables, you buy ten extra. And for every hundred chairs, you buy 10 extra. Okay. So when it comes time for rehab or if something gets broke, you have a backup net type thing. And uh, nobody really, really knows what they're going to do with attic stock. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you also got to play a little part in putting the warehouse together for Disneyland Paris. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, the director of distribution for Disneyland Paris came over and he spent about uh, six months with us in a training program uh, and brought him pretty much up to speed. And then when he, he went back, 
uh, I, I, I wasn't I wasn't scheduled to go back. I wasn't scheduled to go to Paris for opening. But once he got back and and uh, got in, involved, uh, uh, that the opening was taking a whole lot of his time, and he wasn't having uh, a time to to focus real good on the warehouse side. So uh, I went, my boss at that time asked me to uh, on a Saturday to be on an airplane and be in Paris on Sunday morning. Uh, so, uh, uh, I went to, went to Paris, uh, that was in, in, uh, uh, early, early January, first to second of January, right after the first year and stayed, uh, through opening, which was, uh, uh, April 2nd. Uh, I think I came back on the, the, the last week of April, uh, from opening, uh, uh part of it was, uh, uh, all the owner furnished items that were coming through the facility and that was to work with Wed and help them get that stuff out and installed. But I do want to include the, the, the story of you getting your window for everybody. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, my, my, my boss at the time when I was uh, getting ready to retire and, and we sat down and talked and he said, you know, Tom, what would you really like to have for, for your retirement? And I said, you know, you know, if, if, if I meet the criteria, you know, and I wasn't sure what the criteria was, uh, but I, you know, I would love to have a a window on Main Street at Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Okay, uh, well, uh, I didn't get Disneyland, but I did get Walt Disney World. <laughs> uh, so he went through and and uh, uh, made that happen. Uh, got with everybody involved, and 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 uh, I, I, I guess because of my longevity experience and, and uh, contact with Walt and everything that I did. I did uh, meet the criteria to have a window. And so they, they did me up a window on, on Main Street. It's above the cinema on the right-hand side. And it's called uh, Sawyer Fitz Painting Company, uh, proprietor uh, Tom Nabby, Lake Buena Vista, Florida, Anaheim, California. That's <laughs> terrific. Yeah. And, you, and, you were, and you were named a Disney legend a couple years later? Yeah, I thought the window was going to be the cream de creme. Uh, but every five years we go out to Disneyland. Uh, and it's always been on my list, on my uh, not my bucket list, but it's always been on my list uh, to be on Main Street at 10 o'clock, uh, July 17th, on the, on the five-year anniversaries. <laughs> uh, and so we were out there for, for Disneyland's 50th. And we're at the uh, uh, alumni uh, had had a dinner out there at, at the at the Disneyland Hotel, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Jim Cora, uh, who was who was the president of uh, Disney International at the time, uh, sort of said, "Hey, Tom, I'll, I'll see you in September." And Cora is one of these guys that whenever he's got the chance to pull your leg. He's, he's, he's going to pull your leg. And, and if, if, if he throws that line out there and, 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 and he hooks you, then he's going to really in a little bit. So I'm going, I'm going, okay, you know, Jim's, Jim's fishing me here. So he says, oh, no, you know, you, you, know, you and I uh, and uh, Sully have been uh, nominated as uh, uh, Disney legends, and they're going to induct us in September. So. I'm pretty sure we'll see you in September when you come back out here for the Legends uh, ceremony. And, and sure enough, uh, my sister was house sitting. Uh, so when we got back to the hotel room because of the time difference and that type of thing, I, I called and, and uh, uh, asked my sister if there was a letter here for the studio. And she said, oh, yes. And I said, well, why don't you open it up and tell me what it says. And uh, sure enough, uh, we had been... Uh, I had been inducted as a Disney legend, inducted in September of 05. Wow, that, that's really so, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so that that definitely uh, uh, the highlight of, of my career. Now you know the, the this book is sort of sort of neat because I Bob uh, McLean, uh, the publisher. I I was doing a he had a blog and I was doing a little bit of a. Uh, entry into his blog and he sold his blog off and went into the publishing business and and sort of talked me into doing the doing the book i told him you know, i'm not a writer uh he says oh, no don't worry about that i'll 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 send you a recorder and 
and and you dictate and we'll go through it and transcribe it and then we'll go from that point and edit it and do what we need to do and and embellish it where we need to embellish it and <laughs> and, and all that stuff so it took almost two years uh to do that uh and i didn't think anybody was uh uh, was really going to be that interested in reading about Tom Navi, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it appears that I've sold uh, a, a few copies. It's 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 not going to be on the bestseller uh, list, but there's a few folks out there. It is a short story by a very short author, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't take long long to get through it. But uh, I'm I'm really I'm really glad that I boy they. They they worked with me uh, through the whole thing uh, and uh, sort of babysat me through and 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 got it to the, where it was a halfway decent uh, story. Well, we're so glad that you took the time because it it is an absolutely fascinating book and and you have definitely filled in a lot of empty pieces in in our understanding of not not absolutely your history and part of the history of the parks and Tuso. I think we're all in agreement. You know, thank you for taking the time to do this because it is really a wonderful resource. Absolutely, yeah, these books are great. Super. I, you know, I, I, I enjoy sharing my heritage, uh, and I, I, I go out to the park uh, uh, periodically when I get asked, uh, and and uh, have the opportunity to do that and and uh, share it with the people that are that are growing uh, and and uh, developing. Uh, the the park that it is today. Thanks again, Tom. Yeah, Tom, really appreciate you coming on and uh, taking time out this evening to to speak with us. And uh, the stories are fantastic. Brian, thanks to you for getting in touch with Tom and Ab- absolutely. Okay, catch you later. Thank guys. you so much thank for your you. time. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, again, a, a big thank you to Tom Nappy for joining us tonight. Fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, time discussing everything with him and uh, great stories. So, and if you're interested in getting a copy of Tom's book, uh, head over to retrodisneyworld.com forward slash podcast. And uh, right on the episode 16 article, you'll see a link uh, to purchase his book on Amazon. It's available in paperback and Kindle. And again, his the title of Tom's book is From Disneyland's Tom Sawyer to Disney Legend, the adventures of Tom Nabby. So again, thanks to Tom, and uh, hopefully a lot of you will uh, be able to pick up a copy of his book and, and give it a read. All right, before we close it out, uh, we do want to do a little bit of plug for our uh, T-shirts and other other items. Last month, uh, how you unveiled the Roy's Cabin T-shirt, which uh, I think has been selling a couple. We've sold a couple of those so far. Great design, uh, orange on brown and reverse i think right yeah yeah we have some very nice wilderness colors for the they, for they the look, rustic lodge that it is they look great in stickers they look great on uh, anything that's, that's a fantastic design so i want to see someone get a tattoo that's what i'm hoping for. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody if anybody takes the design gets a tattoo let us know i like uh, the coffee mug you know like that looked like it would be sitting on a desk or a bureau in mm-hmm. Roy's cabin you know a couple pens brown pencils in there right mm-hmm. oh. So uh, how this month you have a new one for us, right? Yes. I was inspired by our our discussion with Tom tonight. So uh, we're going to be uh, debuting a T-shirt, which is a, uh, a tribute to uh, the famous wave machine uh, at the Polynesian. So, uh, yeah, so you'll you'll see uh, you'll see that in the store. We're going to have the uh, the newness wave machine company. Excellent. Oh, I can't it. wait. I'm going to be wearing that one. Now, the person who wears that shirt on a boat next to the remnants of the wave machine and does a selfie gets a special prize. So. That, that's, a, yeah. that's an awesome that's call. Great. That's an awesome call. Should we throw one out for the person who stands in the spot of Roy's cabin with the Roy's cabin? With the shirt. The shirt. With yeah, the shirt, that, yeah. So yeah. the first person to do that. Um, so if you want to get your Roy's cabin and your newness wave machine, head on over to RetroDisneyWorld.com forward slash support us that will take you to our red bubble shop and from there you can buy all the different uh, products and designs that we've got uh the the world best-selling retro disney world shirt is still there uh named electrical let's take a look at that for the electrical water pageant shirt and we still have the captain eo uh we've got some mesa verde university things a lot of different uh stuff out there so again retro forward slash support us 
All right. Well, guys, I think it's about time we close out. Uh, we'll run down the, our sponsor list here and uh, see if there's anything else we've got before we close out. Thank you to TicketMama.com for all your Orlando area ticket needs. Visit TicketMama.com for less than gate prices. And we're also sponsored by Rental Car Mama. When renting Orlando, visit RentalCarMama.com for discounts at Advantage Rental Car and other firms. And by OrlandoVacation.com, vacation homes and discount hotels for the savvy Florida traveler. If you're interested in sponsoring the, the Retro Disney World podcast, please email us at info at RetroDisneyWorld.com. All right, guys, I think that's it. I think we need to close out here. Um, as always, thanks to everyone and our listeners. Special thanks to Tom Nabby for joining us tonight. Uh, keep the emails and phone calls coming. We love hearing from every one of you. Tweet us, Facebook, email, whatever you have. Um, if you can, give us an iTunes review, uh, if possible. Let your family and friends know about us. Um, guys, anything else you want to you wanna add? I want to tell them a little bit about next month, Todd. Yeah, Brian, so next month we are going to be uh, talking with R.J. Ogren, who um, was a one of the four lead artists at the Magic Kingdom uh, in the 70s and 80s. He has the distinct uh, uh, pleasure of being able to go into every single attraction, work on every single audio animatronic figure um, and prop. Uh, he's uh, painted some things, and some of the things that he's done to improve those attractions are still there and hanging today uh in rides uh he was also a monorail pilot and uh i believe his wife will be joining us as well and she was a character and has some uh really interesting stories all right now you got well i can't i can't wait because i have man i got questions already yeah it's good i got questions lined up so it's it's a great book there's some great stories there's more wave machine information coming next month Right. And uh, stories about 20,000 leagues as well. So, yeah. All right. Well, with that, we've got to wait a month, guys, until we talk to RJ. But we're looking forward to it. And uh, with that, Brian, take us out. Follow Todd McCartney and Retro Disney World on Twitter and Instagram at RetroWDW. On Facebook at Retro Disney World. And for all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at RetroDisneyWorld.com. On Twitter, follow our hosts, Hal Bowers, at GoAwayGreen. For JT Couser at Hoagie's Garage. And you can find me on Twitter and Facebook, at Brian P. Miles.